Media Lecture. This lecture series is sponsored uh, by the Department of Economics and Statistics. Um, it's in honor of a late colleague of ours, Joe Lucia. I don't know Joe, but many in the department do. From what I hear, I would have liked to know him. And Joe is a very dedicated teacher who contributed significantly to um, the university and the college. Um, we've been running this uh, series since 1988. And uh, it's sponsored, um, founded by a gift from Bill Stewart. Bill, where are you? And thank you very much. And Joe just uh, committed to another five years of sponsorship. So thank you very much, Bill. We, uh, since 1988, we had uh, some very prestigious uh, economists visiting Villanova. Uh, the names are? James Tobin, James Buchanan, Lawrence Summers, uh, Paul Krugman, and Robert Schiller, and many more. So you can refer to this tiny little <laughs> program for specific details. I don't know what's going on, Jack. Why is it getting smaller? The names are getting bigger, so it's really hard to read now. And this year, joining the very prestigious group is Professor John Taylor from Stanford University. John, you're popular. It's packed. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you guys uh, read uh, today's Wall Street Journal. There's a, an article by Alan Greenspan. Jack is holding it, and apparently he's not happy with, with you, John. <laughs> so according to Jack, that means uh, you're very, very important. Uh, professor John Taylor is the Mary and Robert Raymond Professor of Economics at Stanford University and the Bowen H. and Janice Arthur McCoy uh, Senior Fellow at the Hoover In Institute. He formerly served as the director of Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, where he's now a senior fellow, and he was founding director of Stanford's Introductory Economics Center. Um, his field of expertise are macroeconomics, monetary <coughs> economics, and international economics. He's known for his research um, foundations of modern monetary theory and policy, which has been applied by central banks which is probably why <coughs> Alan Greenspan <coughs> mad at you, and a uh, financial market analyst around the world. He has held many important <coughs> positions and won numerous reward, uh, awards, too numerous to mention one by one here. So it's all listed in this tiny little program. Um, uh, without further ado, let me give you Professor John Taylor. like a movie theater suddenly. So thank you for the introduction. Everybody can hear me OK? Can you see me? I can barely see you, but that's OK. So uh, thanks for coming, and thanks for inviting me. Thanks for the introduction. It's an honor for me to be here. And maybe just tell you a little bit about uh, how I got here with uh, this particular view. You can see uh, on the screen is a cover of a book which I just finished in the last uh, couple weeks, just came out. And it's called Getting Off Track. And if you can't see it, there's a subtitle, which is How Government Actions and Interventions Caused, Prolonged, and Worsened the Crisis. And I didn't start out with this particular interpretation of the crisis. It really came as about as a lot of studies, a lot of research, a lot of papers, which are described in this book. But the book is meant to be very short kind of overview, non-technical, but serious, uh, substantive to try to get a feeling of what went wrong, if you like. And so you could think of this as a summary. Uh, this lecture is a summary. This book is a summary of my research, one person's research on the crisis over the last couple of years, uh, since, since before it began, actually. So uh, last November, uh, after we had this terrible panic, if you like, in the markets in September and October, I sat down and said, well, I've been working on this for a couple of years. Is there a way I can just tell a simple story of what all the whole, whole mess, if you like, how it happened? And so I decided, well, maybe I just divide this question of what went wrong into some manageable pieces. You know, this is a puzzle, let's face it. So if you divide this up into smaller puzzles and then look at the pieces, you might be able to figure it out. So I sat down and said, well, one thing, of course, the obvious question is what caused it. And so my first question is, what caused the crisis? 
But then it's really more than that because it's lasted already uh, eight, 18 months or more. Really flared up in August of 2007, and I'll show you that. So the second question is, why has it lasted so long? Why, what's different about this? What can you can look at some reasons for why it's lasted? But then third, last September and October, as I mentioned, uh, it got incredibly worse. And I'll show you some charts to indicate that. And so the third question is, how, why did it dramatically worsen? What really um, made that happen? And as you'll see, in each case, I look at lots of possible explanations, but come to the conclusion that the top of the list of many explanations, and by the way, almost no economic event doesn't have lots of explanations, and same with this one, but sort of on the top of the list of all those three questions seem to be some government actions and uh, in particular interventions. So that's really how I came to this particular uh, title and book and presentation. So let me start then with the first question, uh, what caused it? Um, almost all economic crises are caused by some kind of excesses, monetary excesses frequently, which cause a boom and a bust. And that's true of this crisis, as I'll show you. And the main boom and bust, which got things going, was the housing market. Housing prices accelerating, housing starts, construction accelerating uh, for several years, and then coming down with an incredible uh, jolt, which caused uh, financial dis uh, delinquencies and mortgages and things like that. Okay, so first of all, what could be the monetary excesses in this case? And this is my first chart. So I'm gonna actually go through 14 charts, and uh, each one I hope has a particular simple message. This is the first chart. Actually, I, brought, I, I just took this chart directly from The Economist magazine. You might recognize some of the Economist style, a very cute little headline, loose fitting, uh, play on words and particular graphics. But more importantly, you see this picture has represented two lines, one black color, the other blue, and both of them are over a period from 2000 uh, to early 2007. And the, the vertical scale is percentages, percentage points, 1%, 2%, 3%, etc. And the two lines here, one is the interest rate set by the Federal Reserve, that's called the federal funds rate. That's the blue line labeled actual. So that's what the interest rate was. It was up to 6.5% in 2000. Came uh, zooming down uh, in 2001 during that recession. And then got even lower in 2002, 2003. Got to 1%, held there for uh, about a year. And then started uh, moving back up again to 5.25%, uh, which is the, this particular uh, period. The dark line, which is labeled Taylor Rule, is a uh, indication of what monetary policy would have been had it followed the principles of the 1980s and 1990s. In other words, during this period, the Federal Reserve moved the federal funds rate around according to what would happen to inflation, what would happen to uh, GDP, the overall economy. <coughs> And a pretty good description of what they were doing is this so-called Taylor Rule. It's the same person as me. In fact, I sometimes wish it weren't called the Taylor Rule because it, I lose objectivity when I bring it forth as an explanation. It looks like, hey, just trying to promote his own rule. But, but the truth is, this is The Economist magazine, after all, so what can I say? But the way to think about this is not so much as anybody's rule as just a description of what worked pretty well, if you like, in the 80s and 90s. We, had, we didn't have crises. We had long expansions, two short recessions. Um, and so it was really good economic times. I'll talk to you about that more towards the end. So what is apparent here is that the interest rate that was actually set by the Federal Reserve was quite a bit lower than what they would have set had they followed the procedures to raise interest rates when inflation rises by certain amounts and to cut interest rates by certain amounts when GDP falls. That's the, what the Taylor Rule says. So this is my evidence. It's also the economist's evidence um, for loose fitting or monetary excesses. So interest rates are much lower than they should have been based on this criteria. So that's the monetary excess. And a lot of people have now <laughs> talked about this. And in fact, the um, uh, Wall Street Journal article is referred to in the introduction by Alan Greenspan focuses on this. And 
as you'll see, uh, he has some, and, and I'll explain, I hope, he has some different views uh, about this particular episode. So that's the loose fitting of the monetary excesses. Now, the hypothesis is that these monetary excesses were a factor that led to the housing boom. And to demonstrate that, I just don't want to say that. I'd like to try to prove it in some sense. And to prove it, I need to have a theory or a model of how the federal funds rate affects housing. And so I built a little model for that. And the results of this are summarized in this chart. This chart is over the same period, 2000 to early 2007. Uh, it's measuring uh, housing starts in the United States, the beginning of construction on new homes. And it's, that's the red line, it jagged a little bit. And the, on the, the axis uh, is millions of units, millions of housing starts. And you can see how that was moving up very rapidly, 2001, 2, 3, 4, 5. It, it turned around in the beginning of 2006 and has uh, been continuing down ever since. If you, can, if you updated this till 2009, that red line would be down at the floor. It's basically just continued. So the boom has been followed by the bust. The counterfactual line labeled blue is my calculation based on this model of what would have happened had the Federal Reserve followed the higher interest rate in the picture I showed you uh, previously. So in that case, the uh, low interest rates would not have stimulated so much housing, would not have created the boom, so it would, it would have, you would miss that whole peak part and therefore would have had kind of a more mild cycle of housing rising and then falling and not have had the boom and the bust. So, so that's kind of the, like the evidence that, uh, simple evidence, but a model-based evidence, some theory about why this is a plausible explanation. Now, as I mentioned, people have different opinions. So let me just talk a little bit about um, some of the things that Alan Greenspan and others have said about this, because in a sense, this is my explanation of the cause, because, and we'll talk a little bit more about why the housing boom is so crucial here. But is it plausible, uh, or, or are there other explanations, if you like, or what's wrong with this explanation? So let me consider some of those. Uh, one uh, thing that people sometimes say is, well, the Federal Reserve couldn't have affected the uh, interest rates very much because um, interest rates were affected by global conditions. There was a housing, sometimes called a, a, a savings shortage in the world economy. And that savings, let me just restate that, a savings uh, glut, if you like, a savings surplus in the world economy. And that created lower interest rates, lower long-term interest rates, or lower interest rates more general. So, so the Fed couldn't have affected this, is the hypothesis. Well, one way to look at that is just to go back and look at savings rates in the uh, world economy. If the hypothesis is there's a global savings glut or, or um, excess saving. And what you find is, no, there doesn't seem to be uh, obvious on the surface. In fact, savings rates declined uh, from the 70s, 80s, 90s, and were still quite low, historically speaking, in 2003 and 4. So, the idea of a global savings glut doesn't seem to stand up to this kind of evidence. This was evidence which was available uh, back in 2004 and 5. It was published by the International Monetary Fund. So the global savings glut explanation of the low interest rates and the stimulus to housing uh, doesn't seem to hold water. Now there's more sophisticated views of that. And one is that perhaps the by the way, in this picture, you'll notice that saving rate and investment rate move closely together. Technically speaking, they should be the same because this is the world economy. Some measurement error causes them to be slightly different. But basically, saving equals investment in the, in the world as a whole. We, don't, we can't uh, uh, invest in Mars yet, or the margins can't invest here. So savings and investment is equal globally. So it's a little bit off here because of measurement error. But they move quite less closely together. But another way to um, think about this issue of world saving and investment affecting interest rate is what Alan Greenspan says in his piece today, and that is that somehow intended saving was greater than intended investment. And um, we don't, the problem is we just don't know how to test whether that's the case. So it still seems to me that the, this doesn't really uh, explain why uh, interest rates were low. Other than, uh, uh, except for the fact by monetary policy. 
Now another um, thing that sometimes people say is that housing, there was a housing boom in other countries, housing boom in Ireland and Spain. What about them? I mean, maybe, how can you say U.S. monetary policy or excesses cause that? Well, fortunately, I have a lot of people who have done research on this since I started, and they've found the same kind of story works in other countries. And one illustration of that is this chart, figure four. And this chart is a, a, a scatter diagram which summarizes, I think, a pretty amazing thing. So uh, some economists at the, Europe, at the OECD in Paris looked at this phenomenon in many countries, and they did it by looking at, again, deviations from the so-called Taylor Rule, and they looked at how big those deviations were and see if those deviations could be correlated across countries with housing booms. Okay, so this is the correlation. So on the, on the horizontal axis, you have, if you look carefully, the accumulated differences over the period of 2001 to 2006, the same period as I showed you before, accumulated differences between the Taylor Rule and the actual interest rates uh, set uh, in these countries or regions. And the vertical axis is the measure of housing boom. It's very similar to my housing starts, but it just simply accumulates how rapidly housing was increasing as a share of GDP during this period. And you can see, say, Ireland is up at the top, biggest monetary excess by this measure, biggest housing boom. Spain's up there as well. And then the other side, you have Austria and Germany, where the smallest deviations and the smallest boom. So there is a lot of plausibility here if you look at it internationally. And here you say, well, yes, this did occur in other countries, not just the United States, uh, that you can see as monetary excess is relating to this. OK. Now, let me um, just move on to, 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 to go on from the housing boom issue to the mortgage issue and the issues related to the crisis. This is a picture which shows you a very close connection between the housing boom and the mortgage markets. Its um, period is roughly the same as before, 2002, 2006. The blue line shows you the housing price inflation, very closely correlated to that uh, boom and bust. The blue line shows you that housing price inflation by this measure got up to well into double digits per year, 14% here, held up at that level and then started coming down. If you continued the blue line down to the present, it would probably go through the floor uh, because housing prices are, are declining nationally at this point in time. But the important thing here is that delinquency rates, uh, people getting behind in their payments on subprime adjustable rate mortgages, and foreclosure rates, actually foreclosures, got very low during this period of, of ho rising housing prices. And um, the, the correlation is, is very strongly negative. And then, of course, when housing prices start to uh, not increase so rapidly and ultimately fall, you see these delinquency rates and foreclosure rates rising. So this is one of the connections between those low interest rates, which I argue caused the housing boom, which caused the housing prices, and these amazingly good-looking mortgages that were issued. If you issued a mortgage in 2005, uh, foreclosure rates and delinquency rates remarkably low. If you have a, an underwriter or a program, a program that does underwriting, they're going to give good credit scores to people because of the same characteristics could show that their, their delinquency rates are very low. But lo and behold, that's because of these rising housing prices. And when ri housing prices are rising very rapidly, people have more incentive to make their payments. The, there's a good investment. Price is rising. Uh, take another job or, or don't... Um, um, stay home so much or don't go out to dinner so much, pay your, pay your mortgage payments, don't, that's important to do. But then when housing prices started to fall, it's not such a good investment. In fact, when they go negative, you can have your mortgage worth more than your house. And so then the incentive to pay the, uh, on the mortgage decline and delinquency rates rise and foreclosure rates rise as well. So this, I think, is a good way to see the connection between the monetary policy, the excesses, the housing price inflation, and the mortgage problems. Now I want to go to the, so this I think is enough for me to go on to the next question about what, caused, what prolonged this crisis. But before I do, just to think about here, the first answer is government. Government is the Federal Reserve. Federal Reserve um, deviated from something that worked very well for 20 years, good economic performance. And um, this suggests that that was 
uh, the reason. There, there are some other government activities here, though, that are important to mention. And there's also some private activities that are worth mentioning. So just briefly, on the government side, there was a lot of encouragement this, during this period uh, for, uh, to, to encourage home ownership uh, of, of people that might be otherwise questionable with respect to their credit ratings. So the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were encouraged to buy mortgage-backed securities, securities which had underlying mortgages in them that would otherwise be risky. And the idea was to generate more home ownership, a worthwhile goal. In retrospect, it seemed to be a result in, in very high risk um, development of these securities. And Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the government, government sponsored agencies did this. There were proposals to stop that encouragement uh, that people put forward. The government decided not to implement that, not to, not to rein in, if you like, Fannie and Freddie. So I would say that's another issue here where government made some errors. But what about all the other things? What about the greed? What about the private sector? What about the mismanagement of financial institutions? What about the credit rating agencies that said these securities were good? That's all happened. There's no question about it. But those are phenomena that are always around, if you like. Mis you know, managers, even in the private sector, make mistakes. And um, so that's happened. But the issue here is why did it all happen at this time? And what caused uh, it to occur here? And the timing is so closely related to this low interest rate period in monetary excesses that I have to believe that's the ultimate um, causal factor. Anyway, let's go to the second question. Why did it last so long? Well, first of all, what is it? Here's it. This is my little measure of the financial crisis. Um, it requires a little bit of staring at and thinking about, so let's do that. Uh, this is the period from January 2007 till last August. Last summer, summer of 08. So it, it doesn't go through last fall. It's important to remember that because I'll come back to last fall later. What we're looking at is a interest rate spread, the difference between two interest rates. The interest rates are the LIBOR interest rate. That's the interest rate that banks charge when they lend to each other, interbank interest rates. So uh, Citibank lending to Deutsche Bank, for example. Uh, and this particular loan, these particular loans here are for three months. So it's a three-month maturity, and it's the interest rate on those three-month maturities. So that's the LIBOR. I'm going to subtract from LIBOR a measure of the federal funds rate uh, over the same three-month period. And that measure is called the OIS, or overnight index swap. So it's a, something that's traded in the markets, overnight index swap. And you can go uh, look at it, pull, pull it off the internet. And you can see a measure of what the overnight interest rate is, the federal funds rate, uh, over the three-month period corresponding to LIBOR. Okay, so the difference between these two really is a measure of turbulence in the markets. In any case, you can see what uh, something amazing happened uh, in uh, August of 2007, in particular August 9th and 10th of 2007. This spread jumped up to unprecedented levels. Now, how unprecedented? Well, if you take, in this case, take the blue line and extend it over towards me, over towards the wall, uh, it would be just about where it is in there. Very flow, about uh, 10, 0.1 percentage points, 10 basis points. And it would just be very steady, hardly any movements. And so this jump that occurred in August of 2007 was very unusual. And in a paper I wrote about it uh, soon afterwards uh, with a colleague from the San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank, we called it the black swan in the money markets because it was such an unusual event. Never seen anything like it. It was a fascinating uh, thing to just study, if you like, from a scholarly point of view, but also very important from a policy perspective. OK, so now what caused this? This is, again, a measure. This just shows you that banks, for some reason, are charging a much higher rate when they lend to each other compared to their costs um, starting in August. So why would banks want to charge so much more uh, than they normally have done? And there's really two explanations possible. I'm sure there's more, but to focus on two, the two big ones. One is that there was a shortage of liquidity, if you like, or a shortage of money that they had to lend to the market. So they didn't look kind of a shortage. They charge a little more. And so you saw that interest rate jump uh, dramatically at that point. So a liquidity shortage. 
Another explanation was that there was inherent risk which became evident in the banks. They, their balance sheets, the assets they were holding were now viewed as somewhat more risky than before. So you lend, to, even at that point, people wondered, how, Deutsche Bank, how could Citibank be considered questionable with its balance sheet? Why would Deutsche Bank charge more lending to Citibank and vice versa? It seemed almost plausible at the time to many people, but the truth is that's an alternative explanation. And now it seems a little very plausible, but at that point, kind of a murky, um, a murky explanation. Okay, so those are the two, risk and liquidity. Now, which of those two is the answer is huge for policy. The Federal Reserve doesn't like this spread. And why? Well, because LIBOR is uh, a, an interest rate that affects a lot of other loans in the economy. A lot of mortgages are indexed to LIBOR, short-term uh, adjustable rate mortgages in particular. But so are a lot of business loans. So if that spread goes up, um, interest rates on loans are going to go up. So the Federal Reserve and other central banks where this happened would like to get that spread back down again. Also, since it's a measure of, of attention or crisis in the markets, getting that rate down will be an indication that you're getting beyond the crisis, that it's coming down. And so the Federal Reserve and others would like to see that come down just to show that things are getting better. So there's two reasons to focus on that. What does the central bank do to get this down? Well, that depends on the diagnosis of the problem. There's two diagnoses, risk and liquidity. If it's risk, you do one thing. If it's liquidity, you do another. If it's liquidity, easy to solve, just provide more liquidity. Make it easier for banks to get loans from the Fed. Have cut interest rates rapidly, things like that. If it's risk, well, you got a problem with these banks. You got to figure out how to, what, what's wrong with these assets uh, in the banks. Should they be more transparent about it, or should you try to get them off the balance sheets, whatever it happens to be? So it's a real issue. So what do you do about this? How do you diagnose this? Well, here's what I did at the time with my colleagues. I looked for measures of risk that might be able to tell you what this was due to. One very interesting measure of risk is this red thing here. So this is a diagram, the same period, um, same LIBOR OAS spread. It's squinched down a little bit so I can get everything on the same screen. The blue line is still that same LIBOR OIS spread, but now I've got this red line here, which is simply a measure of risk in the bank, in the interbank market. It's the difference between unsecured loans, which is LIBOR, when you, when city lends to um, Deutsche Bank in this market, it's not secure, they don't have any collateral backing it, but there are other loans that they make in this market which are secure, do have collateral, and those are called repurchase agreements or repos. So here I just say, well, not, what, let's look at the difference between unsecured and secured loans. That would be a pretty clear measure of risk. If there was that, that spread increased, people would be more uh, concerned about lending unsecured. Well, you can see there's an amazing correlation between the red line and the blue line. Uh, not perfect. There's lots of stuff going on in this, these markets, but the ups and downs are very, very close. And more important, you see the very quiet situation early in both of these and the greater turbulence later. So this led me and other people to say, well, obviously this is a risk problem, not a liquidity problem. And, um, but unfortunately, that was not the diagnosis of, uh, of our government. Instead, they said it was liquidity. And so let me give you three examples of how that misdiagnosis led to, if you like, mistreatment of the patient. Okay, here's the first example. When there's, an when there's a theory of not enough liquidity, you provide more liquidity. So one measure of, one thing that the Federal Reserve did and, and other central banks uh, was to create a new loan facility uh, that banks could borrow from the Fed through. It was called the term, term auction facility. It had uh, uh, an opportunity for banks to borrow very similar to discount window borrowing, except it'd be uh, easier to do, it would be more anonymity, uh, less public notice, and more funds could be provided through this auction. So you can see the scale of the term auction facility is on the right, and that went from zero uh, to where it began in December of 2007, and then it moved up to 150 for the US, and on top of that were 
uh, term auction facility uh, lending made available to through other banks in, in Europe primarily, uh, ECB and the Swiss National Bank and the Bank of England. Okay, so what's the deal here? Well, you can see this TAF didn't seem to have much effect on the spreads. So you basically have the jump, the black swan event, and then you have basically steadiness throughout. So if you believe my explanation for the problem, the diagnosis, then you would say, well, this isn't surprising. This is a treatment uh, for the wrong illness, and therefore it's not having an effect. Um, now, uh, if you look really carefully here, you see how things can get confusing. When the TAF was first introduced in December, you, you do see some movements down in the spread. It actually occurred before, but pretty close. And so early on, the Fed and Fed officials and central bankers say, it seems to be working. This is great. And in fact, the theory of it being risk at that point was, began to be discredited. It looked like it was liquidity, it's working. But it didn't last for very long. As things came back up again, you had troubles, the Bear Stearns event in, in the spring, and they just drifted up towards uh, the next phase of this crisis. So kind of the mistreatment in this case, at least it didn't do any good. Second example of, if you like, mistreatment, it's very related, is that in February 2008, we passed a stimulus package in the United States, which was almost entirely, do, entirely consisting of temporary one-time payments to individuals around the country. So checks were, were sent or direct deposit was made in people's accounts around the country of uh, certain amounts of money. And you can track that very nicely uh, by looking at the total income in the United States. So this is a chart, again, January 07 uh, to the, through the summer of last year. And you can see the vertical axis is billions of dollars. And the blue line is people's income as a whole in the United States. And so it's chugging along. We have economic growth, income's rising. And then it blips up in uh, July, August uh, in, of 2008. And that's when these payments were made to people. So huge amounts of money went out. And it's very, very noticeable in our total economy. It just jumped up. Now, the reason for this, of course, was to provide more liquidity to people uh, so that they would spend more and we would jumpstart the economy. We'd get out of this declining um, period to, to get out, try to get out of the crisis on the real side of the economy. But as you can see, nothing happened. So basically, this is a very, very little impact. It's not too surprising based on economic theory, which holds that people tend to spend based on their permanent income due, due to Milton Friedman and Franco Mendigliani. Uh, they uh, argued that you're not going to change consumption very much by one-time payments. People will either save it or run down their debt. So it's not a good way to stimulate consumption. And in fact, that's what happened. Okay? And then the third example is this. The, another way to think about liquidity is to get interest rates down really rapidly. Um, this is a picture of uh, the, the interest rate, federal funds rate again. You saw part of that earlier, but now this is a little later period. It's the blue line. It's measured on the right-hand side. And along with that is the price of oil, which is measured on the left-hand side, going from around uh, $60, $80 a barrel up to around $140 on these monthly averages last summer. Okay, so the cut in the interest rates is quite understandable and quite reasonable even with a Taylor Rule type of calculation because the economy is starting to sink. And, uh, and in addition, inflation, uh, s some signs of inflation coming down. But it, although you can't see it in this picture, this cut in the interest rate is much sharper than that kind of way of doing business on interest rates would suggest from the past. And so what is the result of this? Well, this is very complicated, but my sense is that very sharp cut in interest rates was a factor that made the dollar depreciate rapidly, which it did at this time. And because oil, world oil prices are denominated in dollars, it caused this, at least a factor in causing, let me be as clear as possible, careful as possible, a factor in causing this rapid rise in oil prices. And here, to the extent this was related, is actually counterproductive, because those, that rise in oil prices caused gasoline prices to rise dramatically last spring and summer. 
and it was a real hit to the economy, probably the most significant negative hit at that time. Okay, so those are kind of three examples, if you like, of kind of mistreatments related to misdiagnosis. Okay, and that's why I think the crisis has lasted so long. The third question is, why did it get so bad? What really caused last fall's panic? And so, first of all, let's look at that. This is a picture of the same things, LIBOR OIS spread and LIBOR repo. Remember, that's the measure of tension in the financial markets. There is a jump in August of 07. You already saw that. However, if you go over here and you look at September of uh, 2008, October 2008, you see a jump which is like four times bigger than the black swan in the first place. So this is really big. And this is what I think has really changed uh, the environment and led to what serious crisis, serious downturn, real concerns about how the economy is going to recover. The stock market fell rapidly in this time, really kind of a panic. So what caused this? There's almost a conventional wisdom out there now that this was caused by the decision of the government not to intervene and bail out Lehman Brothers on, on September 15th. Uh, the idea is that caused a panic in the markets and the government should have intervened. I don't think the evidence is very good for that when you look at it carefully. And so I want to look at the evidence as carefully as I can with you. And that's through this chart. Okay. This is a chart of uh, the same variable, LIBOR LAS, right around the time of this uh, peak, right, the jump way over on the right, where it's gone up to 4% uh, and, and the stock markets are uh, 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 panicked. And what I've done, though, is try to look very carefully at each day during this period. So you have September 1st out there to mid-November, and you see the spread there uh, hovering around the level it was for the year beginning in August 2007. And you see some, uh, some dates, okay? So let's, let me just talk about the dates. So September 13th and 14th was a weekend, Saturday and Sunday. And it was over that weekend that there was a lot of concern that, about the investment bank Lehman Brothers and it's perhaps going into bankruptcy and therefore um, it's, it's uh, credit ra raising questions about all the people had made loans to Lehman Brothers, all the creditors, and that concerns that could ripple through the economy. Remember that uh, earlier in 2008, another investment banking firm, Bear Stearns, had actually gotten to the same situation, and it was rescued. It was an intervention uh, to prevent it, the rationale to prevent it from uh, rippling through the economy. Okay, so during that weekend, the uh, word out in the markets was that the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, maybe the government more generally, was dead set against uh, intervening in the sense of providing uh, support for Lehman Brothers. So the answer was no, we're not going to intervene. And then on late Sunday night, uh, that was clearly the decision. So everybody has to figure out what to do. Um, markets open on Monday, there's lots of concern about it. And sure enough, this little measure of spread starts to move. It jumps actually on Monday, it goes, but it's still in the general vicinity that it has been for the previous year. The next day, AIG has troubles it is actually rescued. And then the rest of the week, various things happen, but on Friday, September 19th, the Secretary of the Treasury announces that, Secretary Paulson announces that he will have a new policy with respect to intervening in the banks that eventually was called the TARP um, to re re reflect the troubled assets that ha on, the, on the bank's balance sheets, troubled assets, TA. Okay, so there you are. So far, the, the spreads are not too much further than uh, they had been for the year, came down a little bit on that Friday, and then you have the weekend uh, where the, you don't know exactly what's going on, but there's talk about uh, presenting the TARP package to the Congress, to the American people at the end of the weekend. Well, the weekend comes to a close. On Tuesday, 
September 23rd, Secretary Paulson and Chairman Bernanke go to testify about the new program. They go to the Senate Banking Committee and they present a request for $700 billion for the banks. And they provide two and a half pages of legislation to show how that would work with no description of oversight or how the money would be used. They indicate, I think, to a great extent that this is really necessary and if we don't do this, uh, catastrophe of one sort or another will occur. So in, in, inducing, if you like, a fair amount of fear and scary scenarios. The, co the senators ask tough questions. It'd be interesting hearing if to go back and look so, sometime on YouTube. It's tough questions and the answers were kind of scattered, um, not too consistent and it generated a lot of criticism. Uh, some of those senators got irate mail like they've never seen before about this. And so my feeling is that this uh, is a, really the problem, if you like. A plan was put forth, actually sort of consistent with what had been done for the year, kind of no plan, and it just scared everybody to death. And so now you really see a real deterioration in these markets. LIBOR OIS goes to this unprecedented level that blacks squawn cubed and, um, and it just goes up relentlessly and this is where you can see the stock markets falling and everything else. This did not end until October 13th when there was an announcement that the TARP would be used uh, in a completely different way than what was proposed in the Senate hearing on September 23rd but it was viewed as at least a description or a plan of what would happen and the market started to improve, not only this or OIS spread, but the equity markets as well. Okay, so to make a long story short here, it seems to me that what you're seeing here is pretty good evidence, and we will never know, we'll be debating this for years and years, but pretty good evidence that it was not simply saying no to Lehman Brothers and therefore <coughs> suggesting that we should have had much more intervention or where we are now, almost everything gets intervened in but rather that the process for intervening was not very clear. It's certainly not very clear from the way the TARP was presented and that's a lot of surveys in the financial community that said that the TARP was not easy to understand and of course all through this period there were many questions and it wasn't until the equity part of this was announced that things started to improve. So lots of questions about the uncertainty of that. But if you go back into the earlier part of 2008 Remember the Bear Stearns intervention? There was a lot of questions about that. Why did the Fed and the Treasury intervene there? And of course the answer was, well, we were worried about ripple effects, that the creditors would um, have to um, find fun their funds, they have to ask their creditors, and it would ripple through the whole economy. However, there was a real question about under what circumstances they would do the same thing to another institution. People did talk about what if Lehman Brothers failed at that time. Well, what about other, what smaller instances? What about hedge funds? What would be the policy? But very little description of what the policy was. That uh, roughly speaking, here's what we would do if a situation like Bear Stearns or somewhat different from Bear Stearns happened again. So I would put it this way. The lack of clarity about the government's policy with regarding intervention was the problem, not the specific decisions to intervene or not. And that was, I think, clear to many people through the, through the summer. The, I always say markets were clamoring for clarity and it just continued right through um, the TARP and really made very clear by the TARP itself. So this is my answer, if you like, to the third question, why did things worsen so much? And I think just a terrible amount of lack of clarity about what the policy was uh, throughout the, the period. Okay, I want to uh, wrap up my formal presentation pretty soon. Am I okay on time? No problem, okay. Okay, so when I think of these three things, I kind of want to cry. You probably want to cry too. Everybody, this is terrible. Uh, you know, it didn't have to be this way. My theory, it didn't have to be this way. It's not, I'm not saying that these are mistakes in the sense of uh, if you were there at the time, you or I would have done any better, but certainly as we go back and look at the evidence, it seems like other decisions could have been made. 
And when you say that, when I say that, when everyone says that, you have to remember what it's like to be in these positions, in these circumstances. Uh, you don't have the information we have now. You're thinking about all sorts of issues. You're, it's very hard to say no when there's risks if you don't intervene. But nonetheless, it seems to me that the lesson here is that these interventions have really made things worse. And I'll give you an example where uh, go, taking a different approach, if you like, sort of, if you like, getting on track uh, made things a lot better. And that's this chart. Okay, so we're going to look at this chart for a few minutes. This is an example of what went right, if you like, or getting on track. This is the uh, longer span of time, going back to the late 1940s, and it's a picture of GDP growth, uh, quarterly changes at an, measured at an annual rate. And you can see there's a line drawn in the early 80s, and before that there's lots of volatility lots of fluctuations, and each time that line goes below uh, zero for a couple of quarters, you're seeing a recession, and uh, that's the zero line at red, and you, in any case, you see lots of recessions, lots of volatility on the, uh, my side of the black line in the early 80s. And then you go on the other side of the line, you see an amazing increase in stability. This is what economists call a great moderation. During this period from the early 80s, you had only two recessions up until the one we have now, which you can see very much on the right. That dipping down is where we are right now. Um, probably going to come down a lot further before we're done. Uh, and other than that, these two small recessions and periods of very long, uh, steady growth, long expansions. Economists call this the great moderation. And the, I think the reason it occurred was because of policy getting on track. Policymakers taking a approach like that Taylor Rule thing I gave you, or however you want to describe it. Paul Volcker got inflation down, did a terrific job. Alan Greenspan continued at that, did a terrific job for a long period of time, unprecedented. We've never seen performance like that in the United States. It's actually not just the United States. You can also see similar things happening, although the timing is somewhat different depending on the policy change in other countries. So you see this improvement there as well. And so my feeling, this is an example of getting on track and where if you take a policy of not intervening so much, it's a, a steady as you go uh, policy uh, that you can make things work pretty well. And so my, if you like, conclusion here is that we should be getting back on track. And just to conclude my former remarks before I throw it open to questions, it seems to me that we're not quite on track yet. It seems to me in some sense we're, we're still groping to find a way back on track, and I hope we do so soon. But just as two little points of evidence for that, the stimulus package of 2007 has a lot of elements of the stimulus package of 2008. As one-time payments to people, didn't seem to work. It's uh, increasing the deficit, same kind of thing. So if you think about we should be doing permanent tax cuts or, or uh, a more steady-as-you-go policy, not quite there yet. And then finally, with respect to more clarity with respect to the interventions in the financial sector, we still got a lot of problems with describing what the plan is. The new Secretary of the Treasury in making presentations has uh, not been as clear. The markets are pretty, pretty clear about the lack of clarity. And so, so far, it seems to me, we're not, we're not there. And what we need to do is find a way to get back on track. I think it's pretty clear what it is, but um, we hope the rest of our government does soon, too. Thank you very much. Sure, yeah, I'll take questions if anybody wants to talk about this a little bit. Yeah. Um, what does the Taylor Rule say the uh, effective nominal interest rates should be right now? About where they are, about zero. Unfortunately, you can't go below zero. What, what, the way I think about this is that um, monetary policy fundamentally affects the money supply. The reserve intervenes in the open market, open market operation and increases and decreases the money supply. For a long time, we measured monetary policy by the direction of the money supply. Uh, high, low, that's how the Fed reported on its activities. But the money supply became kind of hard to measure, not so accurate, so we developed these other methods, these interest 
administrative rules or administrative procedures, whether a rule or not, uh, for that. So the focus became on the federal fund. But, but you always had to worry about that in the sense that the interest rate got to zero, you have to go back and rely on those money aggregates again. Or on the other side, if you have interest, if you have inflation, you know, hyperinflation, like Zimbabwe or something like that, you got to focus on the money supply because interest rates are just completely useless. So you always had like a, I think of a fail set. You go back to zero, you got to do something else. You go, you go above 15, you got to do something else as well. So we're not at zero. So the something else is, in some sense, pretty straightforward. Just focus on money growth. Make sure money growth doesn't go too fast. Make sure it doesn't go too low. In the depression, money growth fell very rapidly. That was terrible. Made much worse. Even Schwartz showed that in their study of the, of the period. And so that's what you, the way you should do it. The Federal Reserve is, of course, uh, in the mode now of focusing on money. It, it's producing a lot of money, actually. A huge amount of money decreases as, by various measures. But what you should do is focus on the money supply. And that's what I think they're doing. I think, they're, I think they are producing uh, more money than I'd like to see right now, more recently. But they say they'll be able to take it out uh, at the right time. Yeah? What do you think is the best way to eliminate the counterparty risk problem that you alluded to? Well, it's due to the, the asset, uh, toxic assets on the banks. So that's the question of what do you do about it. I think the most important thing that we, sh we should have done early and still can do a lot more is to increase the transparency about these assets. It's not talked a lot about, but you know, you, you could say why are why is the why aren't they just bought or sold? What is the big spread difference? Good asset. And because people don't know how to value those assets very well, they, they do the mortgage backed securities, a complicated way that the mortgage should put together. So, why is it hard to evaluate? Well, some, to some extent, because they're complex, they're initial relationships. But another reason is because we still don't know a lot about the mortgages themselves, their quality. A lot more information about the documentation of those mortgages could be provided by the servicers to the investors. I think if you do that, you'd be able to value what they are better. In fact, you'd probably be able to get better monitoring. <coughs> okay, so something about those assets is, if you like, clean them up, make them more, make it more clear what they are, what the value is. And I think the recent proposal on housing will help in the following sense, that there's some incentives given to the servicers of the mortgages. The servicers basically are the guys who make sure the investors get whatever money is coming from the mortgage holders themselves. And they're the people, if you like, in the middle who have the opportunity to adjust the mortgages, to lower the payments, to lower the value. So the investors get better, get, get some money back rather than nothing. And they're the ones that have the opportunity to do this. So by giving them a little incentive to make the adjustments, it should be better. Going forward, I agree with that. But I think right now, these have been sold all over the world. Well, I think what I'm just saying, I meant to, I refer to right now, that's a right now thing, right? Maybe or it's not going to be rapid enough, but that's, I meant that as right now, that's what Yeah. Well, I kind of have two part question. Um, the first part of it is, you mentioned the end of your presentation that you think we should like permanent tax cuts and more like take up the say as we go with policies. Do you think, like, think of an example what you think should be done from here on out to like, try to get us through this? And then my second part is kind of like you mentioned tax cuts and kind of I had the feeling the best spending. My thing is like in the 1990s, Japan, when they went through their recession, they cut spending and they experienced the quote unquote last decade. Don't you think we should maybe make their mistakes and try to spend just spend it correctly before we cut back in general? So second question, uh, Japanese did try a lot of spending programs and fiscal policy. <coughs>
Um, you don't know how long, and there's lots of questions about the timing. Uh, the, and it's, the stimulus package of 2009 is similar to the one in 2008. It has a lot of temporary tax rebates. But it's also different in the sense it has more government spending than the other one. Much of the government spending, though, is not on infrastructure. So, for example, in 2009, this year, of the $787 billion stimulus package, only $21 billion is on federal purchases of goods and services. That's the, in the C plus I plus G, that's the G. So it's a very small amount. <coughs> so that makes you worry, well, maybe there's not as much infrastructure spending here as you might imagine. And so most of it is transfer payments or one-time tax rebates. So my perspective, it would be better uh, to make things more permanent. So, so for example, <coughs> the temporary payments are, uh, one example of that is payments to low-income individuals or middle-class people. That's great. Why not make that permanent? And in, in the uh, campaign, President, President Obama called for a middle-class tax cut of 6.2% credit of uh, income up to $8,000. And that, why not, that should have been part of the stimulus system. Let's do that now in the campaign. Let's make that permanent. We get people thinking more confident about the future. But instead, it's a temporary type of thing. I would also say that we should be careful about raising any taxes at this point. It proposes to raise the capital gains taxes, raise dividend taxes, raise taxes on businesses. And that's something that seems to me, I mean, a lot of evidence says it's counterproductive and we shouldn't be going in that direction. So this would be what I would say for, for what it's worth. I get it? Okay. Yeah, any more questions? Or? Yeah. What's the bond market telling us now? Treasury, uh, long term treasuries are down significantly in the last two or three months. Well, there's a search, uh, not a search, but just a seeking quality, basically. There's a lot of risk out there. Treasuries are least risky of any kind of assets. They're going down. Treasury treasuries are going down a lot. 10% or so. Oh, I'm sorry. You're saying the price? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, of course, the interest rates are down a lot compared to what they were a while ago. They've just backed up again. Okay, so, I, so I think, who knows? I would say it's concerns about inflation. What's that like? You're seeing some inflation concerns coming back in. Um, but there's talk about deflation, right? Well, there's talk about deflation, but you know, you, in the meantime, you've got a lot of money out there being produced, and that can come back in and cause inflation. I would say my best guess is the rates are backing up because of worries about inflation. And when you talk about deflation, we don't really have much deflation yet. It may happen, but I don't think what we've seen is oil prices and commodity prices coming down. Core inflation is down a little bit, but I don't see deflation. I might be wrong, I don't see deflation. So my best guess is you're seeing those uh, rates backing up a little bit. It's not a lot, really. Uh, still a lot of ways to go before you really say it was inflation. But I think it's just concerns about inflation down the road. But it's not confidence in America. I mean, a lot of people who own, a lot of the bond owners are abroad, like China and things like that, right? Absolutely. Well, China, well, China is a huge holder of our, of our treasury securities. Another possibility uh, is that we're going to issue a lot of these securities over the next uh, few years. The debt, national debt will double in the next four years. Uh, and the budget projects uh, six or seven hundred billion dollar deficits as far as the eye can see. So it could simply be is that people are worried about how we're going to finance all this debt. But maybe that won't happen. So I think you've got explanations of higher inflation expectations and <coughs> genuine concerns about how the U.S. will finance these incredibly large deficits that we have right now. Yeah? In, in terms of financing this debt, that's going to be an issue over the next few years, uh, what is your impression about the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the availability of savings domestically in the U.S. to, to purchase that debt? Uh, how adequate do you think that is? And to what extent do you think uh, a good bit of it is going to have to be sold overseas, in which case the trade deficit is going to go through the roof? Well, we're going to have to, a lot of it will have to be overseas, because there's just so much, absolutely. So we just hope people will buy it. I, 
I actually worry about being in a position that's, that we have to sell our debt to other countries and we have to tell the Chinese to not you know, buy our debt. It seems like not best thing, not the best thing for us to be doing from a foreign policy perspective. So on the other hand, the savings side, um, we've had a, a, another problem long term in the U.S. is our savings rate's been very low, zero effectively. So it would be good to get that savings rate up again. It is coming up again, and, and maybe that's a silver lining to this whole process. Well, well, my reason for asking was, I heard Paul Krugman on TV a week or two ago, and he said something that really surprised me. He was, he, he was in discussion over this very issue, and he suggested that uh, most of the debt that's going to be associated with the bailout package can be sold domestically, because he said there is what he described as excess savings domestically. And, I, you know, I mean, excess by what standard they have. Uh, I couldn't figure out what he had in mind. And I don't know. It just seemed to me that <laughs> I don't know. Either, cause I don't know if you can hear in the front, but in the back. The question was, Paul Krugman said there's no problem selling all this debt because we've got lots of excess savings. Good benefit anyway. Yeah, because I, I think that it's probably reflecting the fact that the consumption has declined a lot since the panic, basically. The panic, right before the panic, consumption declined tremendously. So that means savings rates have jumped. And Actually, where they are now is, you know, if they stayed at this level forever, it wouldn't be so bad. You know, 4 or 5% savings or it would be just great. But they're doing it very rapidly. And so that's the kind of the crunch. So he may simply be referring to that jump. Maybe things are going to jump up yeah. further. But that's not even going to be enough to finance this debt. It's much larger than it could be supported by that savings rate. So what you're suggesting, because it's the result of something that's just a recent, it's a rapid one-time spike, is probably not sustainable. I think it's more that it's coming so fast. It's a spike rather than a gradual. Mm -hmm. Ideally, it would be we could have our savings rate to zero now, then one, then two, then three, then four, over a span of a year or two. But instead, it's happening like each week we're getting increases like that. So it's too rapid at this point. But it would be it's good to get the total increase. <coughs> yes. The uh, government is the problem, or at least was part of the problem. The government's got to be part of the solution. Can a new government that is grossly understaffed on the executive side, newly in place, and a Congress with uh, a new party taking over with 30 years or 20 years back along with an agenda, can they develop a strategy? Can they implement a strategy to do the things you think would be done? I think so. I think it basically is clarity. You know, here's what we're going to do, and we, will, we'll, we won't wait a month or two months to announce the plan. Here's what we're going to do. It might not be perfect, but we'll just do that for a while. We'll just keep at it. I mean, just don't keep changing. Don't keep doing something different. I think it's so important that, 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 that we do that. What, uh, my story here is a lot about trying to do things and then changing, if you like, or trying to do things differently. Even those very low interest rates at the beginning, that was different from what we were doing before. Maybe trying, trying to do things, trying to do too much, if you like, and that got us off track. So. I don't think it's that hard. You may be you're taking risks, it's a tough, tough job, and you might be making errors, but I think clarity is possible. I mean, this is a, one thing about my story here, it's a story. You, you, can, you can disagree with it, and we can have a debate, and it's terrific, but at least it's a coherent story. You know, it sits there, and we can pull this apart. People need to have a story and understand what's going on, and I think government has not tried not to doing that enough. And actually, you might think about this. My story here has a, quite a bit of negative things about government. Let's face it. Government has a tough time telling negative things about itself. So I think probably that's why you haven't heard it. And maybe that's, maybe that's why you're not getting the story that I think is so important, the clear story, because it, it involves some self-criticism here. And in, in some sense, a new administration has the opportunity to move in a different direction. And I think this administration wants to do that. But as I'm looking at it here, it's not that different. You've got the same kind of stimulus package. You've got the same lack of clarity in the banking sector. So as much as we, you, you hope for a different way, and I certainly do, you can see from my criticism of the previous uh, year and a half, it seems to me we're not there yet. 